If, if you were here last week, you know that we're going to start the new year uh, in a series called Life's Weightier Issues. Uh, we decided we're going to just start the new year off by wading into some topics uh, like meaning. Last week we looked at, uh, you know, what gives life meaning? Where does real meaning in life come from? Uh, next week we'll look at the topic of time. It's an interesting thing to think of. You know, you're really busy. What are you doing and accomplishing? And how do we look at time in our lives. We'll look at relationships. Uh, we'll look at another topic called listening, listening to God. Okay, if there is a God out there, he has communicated to us. That would be some like really valuable information and in how do we make sure we hear that, listening to that. And then we said, we'll wrap it up with a lighter topic of death and judgment, you know, at the end of the thing. So that's, that's where we're headed. Now, now, to guide us through the discussion, I'm really not qualified to do that. And so, um, you know, and you've probably had discussions on those topics when a group of people sit around over a cup of coffee or in a dorm room and pool their, pool their opinions. But to help us um, process those topics, we're going to the book of Ecclesiastes. So go with me there. If you have your Bible, turn to, to chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Um, grab a Bible in the rack in front of you. We'll be on page 559. Now, 
King Solomon, um, I believe it's King Solomon, as he speaks as the preacher. He portrays himself as a preacher. One commentary said the preacher is his ghost writer, uh, and I like that. He says he, he's the preacher. Now, Ecclesiastes is a strange word to us. It is a Greek word for the preacher, all right? So he's, he, this is who's communicating to us. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verse 10, it says, this is at the end of the book, and he's telling us what how he wants this book to be used in our lives. So in chapter 12, verse 10, he says, The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails. Firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given uh, by one shepherd. So he's saying, look, I really get this information from God. Um, but the information that's here, he's saying, the things that I've collected here, these sayings, these wise sayings, are going to be to us like goads. It's going to poke us and prod us. We're going to go, ouch, because he's going he's to jab into some of the shallow ways that we think and see life. But then once that becomes so upsetting, then he says there are also things in here that are like nails, something that you can truly anchor your life to and hang your life on. So that's, uh, that's, that's where he's going with this, all right? So like last week, um, you know, we talked about meaning. And so today the topic is enjoyment. Today the issue is enjoyment. Now, you say, well, that's a lot more better topic than last week, meaningless. You know, every, you know Solomon, everything's meaningless until... God showed up, and then it all changed. Well, today it's enjoyment. Now, everybody wants to enjoy life, right? Do an interview, go down the street. Would you like to enjoy life or not? Duh, you know, yes. You, you, meet, you, you really don't meet anybody whose goal is to be miserable in life. Well, I'm just aimed at being miserable. Now, some people live like that and act like that, and you think that's what they're pursuing, but basically um, we want to enjoy life. Life, But what we find, right, if we're honest with ourselves and really take a look at our own heart, which Solomon does, it's very interesting. He says, I'm going to take an honest look at my heart and ask the hard question. Okay, we're pursuing enjoyment. Have we really found it? Really? You know, and are you willing to be honest enough with your own heart? Solomon was. Okay. And, and, and he looked at an honest look in the mirror, and, 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 he, t and he took at this thing. Now, the, the reason he's so important and why we're listening to him is he's really the voice of experience, okay? He's the voice of experience on this. I mean, Solomon is, is, is that guy who says, all right, I've, I've checked this thing out. I've pursued a lot of paths to find enjoyment, and, and I can come and speak to the topic, you know? I mean, this, he was crazy rich. He was super smart. He was king, and he had the ability to, I mean, he, he had all those things, so he's got the ability, the freedom to, to do whatever he wanted to do, go wherever he wanted to want, and try anything he wanted to try. And so he's coming to speak to us on this. I mean, we value the voice of experience all the time. For example, if you're thinking about taking a trip to somewhere, you find somebody who's been there, and you say, well, how was it? Was it worth me spending all that time and money to fly over there to see it? Or, or you hear about a movie, and then, and then somebody says, well, I saw it, and we want to hear from them. Or you're thinking about buying a particular car or product or whatever, and you say, hey, you've got one. Can you tell me about it? So you and I really value the voice of experience. Well, Solomon is this guy. If you value enjoyment, if you want to find enjoyment in your life, this is the guy you need, need to listen to, right? Uh, there's some people who make statements about what you can enjoy and can't, and you go, yeah, well, what do you know, right? The guy who goes, who doesn't have any money, who says, oh, money isn't all it's cracked up to be. And you kind of want to go, well, how do you know, you know? Um, you know, someone who's never made it to the beauty pageant saying beauty's meaningless, you go, well, you know, you, you don't say it out loud, right? But you're thinking, yeah, well, but what if Halle Berry tells you that? Well, she did. 
Beauty is essentially meaningless, and it is always transitory. And so you go, whoa, maybe I better think about that. Yeah. Right? Uh, there's a guy. That's right, amen. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> amen. I like amen section. Uh, there's a guy, his name is Ralph Barton. Now, this is a, a few years ago. Wow, he's kind of skewed, isn't he? Um, but he was, uh, he was a, a well-known cartoonist, cartoonist, very successful, you know, hung around with all the right people, and he lived in uh, New York, he lived in Paris for a while, kind of been there, done that kind of a guy. It, you know, he's the kind of guy, like, hey, he's living the dream, you know. Well, um, here's what he wrote just before he took his own life. I have had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. I have gone from wife to wife. You know, some people go, well, if I just had another wife. He goes, I think I have another wife, you know. It was a wife to wife, from house to house. I have visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up with devices to fill up 24 hours of the day. He was living the dream, I thought, but he, he found it lacked. It, it didn't deliver, okay? So, so the voice of experience is extremely valuable, especially for you and I, because if we're wanting to find enjoyment, I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time and resources chasing it and find out at the end of the day, well, it's not here. So, Solomon's going to speak. Solomon is basically the guy who can really say, I've been there and done that. He, Solomon's the ultimate, I've been there, done that guy, have the t-shirt, okay? Now, what he's going to do in chapter 2 is he's going to talk generally about three groups of people, generally three groups of people, and these are three groups of people heading down different trails, and they're heading down different paths to find enjoyment. I'm going after enjoyment over here. I'm going after enjoyment here. I'm going after it over here. And what's going to happen is every single one of these groups, as they head down the trail, they're going to meet Solomon coming back the other direction. And Solomon's going to say, been there, done that. It's a dead end. Trust me. That's what he's going to say. Because you notice in chapter 2, did I cover this? I think I skipped it on the screen. Don't go back. Just read it. Chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Listen to what he says. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity, striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So he's going to say, I went down a lot of trails and found them to be meaningless. So if you want to hear from the voice of experience, listen up. That's what he's saying. All right. First group he addresses are the pleasure seekers. The pleasure seekers. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 2, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to chase it, right? I'm going to test you with pleasure and see if I find enjoyment. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said to laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. In other words, he's smart enough to go, you know, you know, being a drunk isn't exactly <laughs> the road to enjoyment here. But he says, you know, there's joy, there's pleasure in the wine. So I'm going to walk that really interesting path where I'm going to enjoy it, but not like, you know, have it destroy me, and let's see where that takes me. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of his life. So there we go. Follow Solomon. He heads down the whole pleasure seeker road and he spares himself uh, no opportunities, right? He's going to, he, if it looks pleasurable to him, he dives into it. Laughter. He talks about laughter. You know, it's good to laugh. He says it's mad. You go, wait a minute, it's good to laugh. Didn't Solomon write in Proverbs that laughter is good medicine? It is. And he would say it is. But he also says, you know what? But for some people, life is a joke. 
everything is a joke. And he says, I looked at that and I went, wow, if just laughter is all there is, it's madness. Later on in chapter 7, verse 6, I, I love this image. He says, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, you ever build a, a fire and it crackles? Uh, for the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. So he says, you know, I went to the party, and you have too. Gone to the party, and there's, there's that person there, and everything is ha, 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 And you go, wow, it, they're, they're, it's maddening. You know, the shallow silliness of life that comes from, from a life like that. You know, how much, you, know you, you look at the humor in sitcoms, the humor in the movies. Don't you ever come away from that going, this is madness. Are you serious? I mean, can I say it? You know, how many more movies are they going to make where some guy gets hit in the groin with something and it's funny? I mean, when are they going to get over that? You know, does it ever hit you? Does it ever strike you? I would say that for you and I now, from this point on, whenever we see a picture of Robin Williams, you know what it reminds us of? It reminds us that laughter was not enough. Laughter was not enough. And this is what Solomon is pointing to. Laughter's not enough because behind the laughter, and nobody, nobody like Robin Williams, I mean, the guy was so funny. Um, but there was meaninglessness, right? There was something very, very much missing. And so Solomon goes, I tried that. I, I went into entertainment, you know, pleasures, whatever I, I wanted to, to entertain myself with. Look at verse 8. Uh, this, uh, down, take your eyes down to verse 8, the second part of the verse. I got singers, both men and women. You like to go to a concert? Uh, you like a special music group? Um, Solomon would just own it. <laughs> you know, um, this is my, you know, you like the group? Great. I own it. They can, they come play for me anytime I want to, you know, so I entertainment. And then he says, and many concubines, uh, the light of the sons of men. So pleasure seekers go down, entertainment and sex, you know, the extreme sports or, or, or the sex thing. Solomon says, I did that. I went down there. And man, our culture, when it comes to the sex thing, we're trying really hard, aren't we? We are very committed to pursuing this trail in our culture. It, it's, it, we're really committed to it. Uh, here's, here's a quote. You say it's small print. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll read it to you. I don't want some of these words just like in five foot on the screen. No, I'm kidding. Here, here's the quote. The sex drive is now declared to be the most vital mainspring of human behavior. In the name of science, its fullest satisfaction is urged as a necessary condition of man's health and happiness. Sex inhibitions are viewed as the main source of frustrations, mental and physical illness, and even criminality. Sexual chastity is ridiculed as a prudish superstition. Nuptial loyalty is stigmatized as an antiquated hypocrisy. Sexual profligacy and prowess are proudly glamorized. The traditional child of God created in God's image is turned into a sexual apparatus powered by sex instinct preoccupied with sex matters, aspiring for and dreaming and thinking mainly of sex relations. Sexualization of human beings has about reached a saturation point. Our civilization has become so preoccupied with sex that it now oozes from all pores of American life. You say, wow, did somebody write that last week? You know who wrote that? That's a quote from a professor from Harvard sociology professor from Harvard in his book, The American Sex Revolution. The book was written in 1956. Solomon wrote 3,000 years ago. And he says, sex? I, I had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Concubines is harem. Women that just, whenever he wanted the sex, that's what they were there for. He had pleasure to pursue. He had women to, to, to grant it. Solomon goes, you know what? I, I wrote the book on this. 
In verse 10, at the beginning of the verse, he says, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. He had the opportunity, he had the money, he had the whatever, and he just did. And he comes back to all the pleasure seekers and says, you know, now listen, you've got to understand the balance of Solomon. We can swing the pendulum in, in, in imbalance. Solomon, listen, is not saying it wasn't pleasurable. That's not what he's saying. Solomon's not saying that the wine and the women in the song was not pleasurable. But what he's saying is it will not and cannot quench man's deepest spiritual thirst. And what he also is saying is, listen, I had every opportunity, and I pursued it stronger and harder than any of you. And he's saying the reality of it is this. The pleasurable highs quickly pass. The pleasures have diminishing returns. And ultimately, they leave you empty and unsatisfied. And if you're lucky, you won't be addicted to it and have it really destroy you. Pleasure seeking never fills a ticket for the meaning of life. And so he says, you know what? I tested my heart with pleasure. And you know what I said? What use is it? All right? So second thing he looks at. The next group of people that he's going to talk to are the empire builders. The empire builders. These are the movers and shakers. These are the ones that are building a business, building a legacy, building a family, building whatever. All right? Chapter 2, verse 4. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. You know, you think your landscaping is pretty impressive? Eh, Solomon goes, seriously? Throw a shrub in there. You come and see what I got going. All right, I made myself pools from which which to water the forest of growing trees. And then he said, well, you say, well, how do you take care of all that? Well, he didn't have to. I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. Verse 9, so I became very great. And I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. I was number one on the Forbes list. Um, Also, my wisdom remained with me, he says. So Solomon kind of goes, you know, been there, done that. You want to pursue empire, money, projects, uh, whatever all those things bring. He says, look, here's the deal. I had more than everybody else. I had more than everybody else. I was better than everybody at the projects. I was smarter than everybody else. That's not brag. That's just what it is. That's just what it is. Check the list. Compare it. And he comes back from all that, and he says, my goodness, it's just meaningless. You know, my t- yeah, I enjoyed, he, he, he says, I enjoyed the projects. You know, he got into the projects. He did them, and there was, he, he, there was enjoyment that he found it. Hey, this is a new project. Let's get this. He said, but you know, if, if that's like your life, If this is where you're going to find ultimate enjoyment in your projects and empire building, he goes, it's worthless. It won't deliver, trust me, he says. This past week, um, maybe you're into sports and, you know, the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame introduced its new uh, class. Randy Johnson and some others were inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. I I, I, I came across... uh, uh, my old, this is one of my favorites, Al Kaline. All right, I grew up outside of Detroit. Al Kaline's in the Hall of Fame. Um, he played in the World Series 1968 team. Yes, I can give you the lineup if you ask me, uh, the lineup of the Tigers in 1968. And Al Kaline uh, was a part of that team. He's in the Hall of Fame. They had a big dinner for Al Kaline. 2,500 people came uh, to honor the guy. They read all his accolades and all that he'd done. Then I got up to introduce him, and he gave a speech. In the, in, in the midst of his remarks, here's what he said. There must be something more to this life than chasing a lot of fly balls, getting a lot of base hits, and making more money than you can spend. 
Do you hear that? How many families and people are sacrificing what as their kids pursue sports? And Solomon and Al Kaline and others come back and say, you know, wait, wait, there's got to be something more than this. A guy named Tim Kasser uh, is doing research, and he comes out with a work called The High Price of Materialism. He's a psycho psychology professor, and he's trying to research and measure materialism and well-being. In other words, is, is there a tie to materialism and people's enjoyment level? Here's what his research found. Although United States, although U.S. income has doubled since 1957, the number of adults saying, quote, that they are very happy has declined from 35% to 29%. And see, what Solomon does is he comes in and he goads us, right? He plot, prods the affluent seekers. You're going to be affluent? You're going to build your empire? Yeah, and then he goes on and says, here's another thing to think about for all the empire builders. Verse 18. I hated all my toil in which I toiled under the sun. You say, wait a minute, Solomon, you just said you enjoyed these projects. Oh, I did. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them. But I got to the place where they became bitter in my mouth. Well, how did that happen? Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is vanity. And you know, men face this all the time. Guy works really hard in his life, real hard. He's wise, goes, you know, gets up early, goes to bed late, brings his best to the business and the whole thing. And then he sits down and does some financial planning, look at retirement, put together the will, and all of a sudden it dawns on him in the lawyer's office. Oh my goodness, everything I have worked for and strived for, I'm leaving it all to who? And then the lawyer's asking him, who? We've got to write the names down. And then the guy starts to think about it. Oh my goodness. I'm not going to leave it to that fool. Well, who are you going to leave it to? Well, I don't know. But, and, and so Solomon goes, how do I know that all this work won't, you know? And, and so he, he, he's like, wow, why did I work so hard? Verse 20, so I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is the kid that's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Dad works so hard and so hard, so hard, so hard. And the son goes, thank you. <laughs> and you go, and Solomon goes, no, this is driving me crazy, right? I got to leave it. Verse 22, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils under the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation even in in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. I hear the same thing from mothers who say, I gave my whole life to raise that child and they've totally walked away from everything that I ever taught them. It's a waste. It's meaningless. You know, under Solomon's leadership, under Solomon's leadership, his wise uh, amazingly gifted leadership, the uh, Israelite nation grew to unprecedented glory and prosperity. Unbelievable what happened under Solomon's leadership. And then Solomon died. His son, so his son Rehoboam came to power. And through some unwise decisions and some crazy things, the kingdom splits. This is Solomon's son. He comes along, the kingdom splits. On top of that, here comes Egypt. They come marching up right into Israel, right up to Jerusalem. And guess what? He ends up, the, the, the king of Egypt ends up taking all the treasures out of Solomon's temple. 
And you go, what? Everything Solomon built. And by the way, David, Rehoboam's grandfather, raised the money for it. So do you see what's happening? David raises the money. It's on David's heart. What a godly guy, a man after God's own heart. His heart for the temple. He takes all these offerings and all this money comes in. And the plans were developed by David. And then David hands it all to his son Solomon and all his wisdom. He builds it all and the whole thing comes. And grandson comes along and wastes the whole thing. And Solomon's saying, is your whole point of life to leave a legacy? That's what, what? T.S. Eliot, in the words of T.S. Eliot, something must have stirred in him. He says, and the winds shall say, here were a decent, godless people, their only monument, an asphalt road, and a thousand lost golf balls. And Solomon would say, that's what I'm talking about. Now there's a third group. Solomon comes and he meets them as they're chasing down the trail saying, I'm going to find enjoyment and satisfaction here. And the third group is the academic achievers. The academic achievers. Now, if you happened to notice that on the screen the word achievers is spelled wrong, I did that on purpose just to bug those of you who are. <laughs> I put it in the outline, but the staff, I couldn't get it through the staff. They fixed it all and corrected it. So it's right in your outline. The academic achievers. So, so this is the group that says, you know what? I'm just going to be smart. You know, I'm going to be smart here. But watch this. Uh, verse 12. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. And then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly. See, Solomon all the way along here, he goes, you know what? There are pleasures. I did enjoy these projects. And you know, he says, wisdom, there, there's, there's, there's gain in that. There's, there's more gain in wisdom than in folly as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, <laughs> but the fool walks in darkness. And yet, he says, I perceive that the same event, the same fate happens to all of them. And then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen also to me. Why in the world did I study so hard? <laughs> you know, why, why have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all who have been, all will be long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done unto the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and striving after the wind. Again, notice that wisdom and knowledge clearly have value. The wise enjoy benefits in life over the fool who goes through life clueless to some principles and patterns of which God's woven into the universe. There is his truth that if we live against it, we're just going to run into it. He says, you know, the wise person is attuned to these things and enjoys benefits from living a wise life versus the fool who's clueless and faces the consequences. But he says, you know what? If the whole goal is to be smarter than the other guy, wiser than the other guy, he says, something smacks me in the face in a hurry. We both die. The same event happens to all of us. And, and, and we're soon forgotten whether we're the Val Victorian or we couldn't get our GED. You know, and he says, you know, what's with that? What's with that? I, I have had the privilege of being a part of two um, college, university, president inaugurations. Um, these are big deals. These are, these are impressive affairs, okay? Um, 
uh, the peers come, other presidents and important people and from other colleges and universities, and, and, and there's a whole group of people, and uh, I, I had a chance to, to, to be a part of, of two of them. And so everybody is robed, and the regalia of academic achievement is... Everybody's got it on, and they and they you gather in a room, and they put you in order of how you're going to march in, and everybody marches in, and the music's playing. It's impressive, trust me. And you go you go in there, and then you have your your seat of honor, and you sit down, and then you you got a spot in the program. Okay, I'm supposed to get up, and they tell me when when you know when the program, what parameters of what you're supposed to say. I, this is a big impressive deal. You know, Solomon says all the pomp is vanity and striving after wind. Because in the end, the dead guy, that dead guy with all the letters after his name is just as dead as the guy who can't spell his name. In chapter 9, verse 11, there's another, it, it, it should poke and prod and go to anybody who's got you know all the success formulas chapter 9 and he'll later say and again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong nor bread to the wise nor riches to the intelligent nor favor to those with knowledge but time and chance happen to them all you've seen it haven't you the guy who's clueless all of a sudden is the rich guy and then the guy who's very conscientious, works real hard, very disciplined, got the integrity, studies really hard, got his MBA and his GPA, he goes bankrupt. <laughs> and Solomon looks at this thing and goes, really? You think you got this like success formula that you're going to build and nothing can stop me now? He laughs at that. Solomon laughs at that and said, you know, time, like death, happens to everybody in chance. The world rolls, o rolls over on a random group of people every now and then. What's up with that? A guy named Derek Kidner said, if every card in your hand will be trumped, does it really matter how we play? And that's Solomon's point. Oh, you're really smart? You're going to play a smart hand? If every card you play is trumped, does it really matter how you play? Now, Solomon, Solomon's not saying there wasn't uh, some intellectually stimulating conversations he was a part of. He didn't say he didn't enjoy learning. No, 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 there's great joy in that. There's great joy in, in, in that. But he's saying, look, if you're going to explore enjoyment and you're going to take pleasure seeking and that's going to say, that's my goal. It's all about pleasure seeking and I'll find enjoyment. Solomon goes, eh. He said, if you, if you, it's empire building and the money and the great things that goes with it. All, eh. If it's, ac eh. He said, it's meaningless. It's, it's chasing after the wind. Solomon says, uh, if life really is made for weekends, then we're all, uh, we're, we're, we're in for many, many meaningless, unsatisfied Monday mornings. And he says, trust me, I've been there, done that. These are goads, and now he's going to give us the nails. You say, well, that's very disturbing to tell me that everything I've been chasing in life is, is whatever. Now, remember, Solomon's not a pessimist. He's a realist. And Solomon says life is meaningless until the day you bring God to the table. And so he's saying all these things. I've been there, done that. It doesn't deliver. It's meaningless. And then he says, but what if we bring God to the table? Everything changes. Look, chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. I love this. This is where the light comes through on what's pretty dark, you see. There's nothing better for a person. You say, well, Solomon, there's nothing out there to do. Well, there's nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil, his work. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Wow, this is a gift. For apart from him, see, apart from God, if you leave God out of it, he says, man, apart from God, who can eat 
and who can find enjoyment. He says, you leave God out of the equation, you'll chase enjoyment the rest of your life and never find it. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, it's a person who's going to live life their way and do their, he's given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This is vanity and striving after, after the wind. So here's the deal. He says this, there's nothing better for a person than what? Than to find enjoyment. Find enjoyment in God and his gifts. You have to find, this is where enjoyment is found. Don't miss Solomon's point. Don't miss the voice of experience. Don't miss this nail that he gives us to anchor our hearts and life's passions and directions on. He's saying ultimate joy and satisfaction can only be found in God himself. Only can be found in God himself. And then and only then are you free to truly enjoy the good gifts that he gives you. And you discover them and you see them and you go, oh my goodness, this came from the hand of God. And so it's 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether I eat or drink or whatever I do, I do to the, to the glory of God. Oh my goodness, God, I find such enjoyment just in you, yourself. And then look at this, I have food. Look at this, I have meaningful work. I, it's, it's amazing. And you're just, you just spend life just in this grateful days of contentment. <laughs> and Solomon goes, there it is. There it is. See, when we marginalize God in his gifts, when we marginalize God and then just say, well, I'm going to pursue his gifts, that's what idolatry is. The good gifts from God, if we turn them into idols, we want to pursue them apart from God. Solomon says, it's, it, it, it'll disintegrate in your hand. It, it's, the analogy I like to use is, is like, you know, a, a dog is a wonderful pet to have, right? Enjoy, you'll enjoy your dog if you see him as a pet. But if you go, you know, it's pretty cold outside. I think I'm going to saddle up my dog and ride to Miami. You know what? You're going to get real frustrated with your dog. You're going to get angry with your dog because your dog's not delivering what you expect your dog to deliver. Come on, dog. And your dog looks at you and goes, I'm just a pet. You know? So God gives us good gifts. If we take those and try and make them our soul's enjoyment and satisfaction, it, it'll never work and we'll get frustrated and we'll get angry. Enjoyment has to be in God and then we can be free to enjoy his gifts. I was talking to somebody this week, uh, another guy this week, about the book of Ecclesiastes, a delight conversation with him. And he said, he says, Solomon seems to be telling us it's important that our GPS, our life GPS is set on God and we don't get it off. That's, that's so important. So, you know, you get your GPS and you type in, you type in where you want to, what you want your GPS to be set to. Listen, if you want to know enjoyment in life, you got to get your G, you got to get your life and heart's GPS and program in God himself. And then af, as you are pursuing that and chasing this, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my joy, with all my strength. And then you realize God then just he gives us these gifts. Here, enjoy this. Enjoy this. Enjoy this. And you do. And it's that's it. That's it. Watch this. Over and over, he hammers home this theme in Ecclesiastes. Chapter 5, verse 18. You ready? You're flying? Chapter 5, verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions, okay, they got these good things, watch, and the power to enjoy them, and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is a gift of God. You see, he's enjoying God and his gifts. Verse 20, I love this. I would love this if it was true and they wrote it on my tombstone. If it was true. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Oh, if that would be said of me. Don't that, you know, wouldn't you want that to be said of you? 
Are, are you ready to take enjoyment seriously? He goes on in chapter 6 and he says, there's an evil that I've seen. This is very interesting. Listen to what he's saying. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, he's living the dream, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. And a stranger enjoys them. It's a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, that was kind of like ultimate success in Old Testament times, you know? Father a hundred children and live many years. So that the days of his years are many, but, he says, his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial. I say a stillborn child is better than he is. So he goes, wow, you got to find enjoyment in God and his gifts. And he says, Solomon says, I've seen a thing that's very grievous. He says, you know, there are some people that get the good gifts of God. God rains down his gifts on the just and the unjust. He says, I've seen people that get a lot of God's good gifts, but they don't have the ability to enjoy them. God's not given them the ability to enjoy them. You know, somebody works really, really hard when they're young and they don't have any money and they're eating macaroni and cheese because that's all they can afford. And then later on in life, they're very, very well off. They can buy anything on the menu and the restaurant. But the doctor told him he can't eat it. And Solomon goes, wow. I, I'll never forget, I, was, I, was, uh, I had some meetings in Florida, and they set us up to stay in some people's homes, very gracious people. And, and I stayed in this beautiful home in, in Florida. It was in the wintertime, too, so it really looked nice. And this guy had this beautiful home with a pool, and it's all, you know, screened in. And, and in his garage, he's got this golf cart, and then all these golf clubs and everything lined up. And I thought, man, and it was right, right on a golf course, right, right by the golf course. And so, you know, we meet the guy, and I go, man, how's it going? Good. I said, man, dude, you're like living. This is it. I says, uh, so you, you, you want to go play some golf? You got time to, to do it? He goes, ah, I just don't play. I don't play anymore. And I'm thinking, you got a golf cart in the garage, you got all the clubs, you're right there. And they, what do you mean you don't play anymore? He goes, you know what he said? I just don't enjoy it. That's a shame. Now I got into why. The guy had an amazing handicap, like plus four. If you're a golfer, you know, like that's better than scratch. And he goes, you know what? I get out there and ah, I just I just can't enjoy it. And Solomon says, you know, I've seen that kind of thing. And isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Chapter 9, verses 7 to 10. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 to 10. Again, he comes up. Go and eat your bread with joy, he says. You got a piece of bread? Eat it with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. It's like God goes, look, I gave you these gifts Enjoy them. Is it okay to enjoy my steak? <laughs> yes. God says, yes. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. I love this. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Verse 10, I love this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might, with passion, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. You know what Solomon's saying? There's nothing better for a person than this. You mean you have work? You have work? Having work is a lot better than not having work. You have work. Enjoy it. Do you have a meal? Do you, do you, have, do you have work and you're able to bring home food? Wow, enjoy that. You mean you have work and, and it brings home some food and you have someone to eat it with, like a wife? Whoa. Solomon says, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Now enter deeply, deeply into that. That is enjoyment. God and then his gifts. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Oh, we need that so bad. Chapter 8, verse 15, 
And I commend, I commend joy. See, Solomon, you start reading Ecclesiastes, you go, this guy's a Debbie Downer. (laughs) No, he's not at all. He's not a pessimist, he's a realist. And he says, look, I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink. These simple pleasures, I love this, to eat, drink. You know, I would add, watch the sun come up. You know, I know it's freezing cold, but I had a breakfast appointment this week, and I is uh, pulling into the, into the parking lot of the restaurant. I got out, and the sun was just coming up. And I thought, I don't care. I'm staying out here in sub whatever weather. I'm just going to watch this come up, and I'm going to envision that I'm in Florida watching it come up over there. But, you know, and I enjoyed this. It's like, really? Yeah, you, you, there's joy. See, he's saying, in, in, in joy. I commend joy. Nothing better under the sun. Eat, drink, and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Do you realize something? That God commends enjoyment. In fact, he's very serious about it. God commends enjoyment. See, when you think about life and enjoyment, many people have this picture that God is a killjoy. Well, he won't let me do this. He won't let me get drunk. He won't let me do, do this. He won't let me do this. He doesn't want me rich. No, no you, you totally, totally don't, don't see it. Don't see it. No, 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 no. It's not at all. God commends enjoyment. In fact, he's very serious about it. I, I like this quote, a couple things. Haddon Robinson, a, a great Bible teacher, Um, He said, in Old Testament theology, it is not just a shame not to enjoy life. It's like, wow, that's a shame they don't enjoy life. It's not just a shame not to enjoy life. It is a sin not to enjoy it. If it comes to you from the hand of a good God, enter into it with thanksgiving and enjoy it. Seize the day, live to the hill, enjoy God's gifts. This is the message of Solomon. Uh, the Jerusalem Talmud <laughs> say sounds like a stuffy piece of literature. Every man says this, every man must render an account before God of all the good things he beheld in life and did not enjoy. Wow. So convicting. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I, you know, we're already late, and the children's workers are already going to shoot me. <laughs> but you know, I was thinking about this this week and praying. You know, God, I so want to know enjoyment in my life. You know, and and you know what it was crazy. What struck me um, over Christmas, uh, Holly and I, one of the traditions, we like to watch as many versions of the Christmas Carol as we can. And so we've seen George C. Scott and Henry Winkler and, you know, Jim Carrey and Scrooge uh, and Mr. Magoo. That's one of my favorites. Um, so we get all these. Well, I'm watching it this year. And, um, and, then, and then here comes Bob Cratchit. It's the day after Christmas, and he's late. And Scrooge, Cratchit! And Bob Cratchit says to Scrooge, I'm sorry, I was making a little too much merry yesterday. And I thought, when's the last time anybody accused me of making too much merry? Psalm 90. Listen to the heart of the psalmist here. He is, he's serious about enjoyment. This psalmist is serious about enjoyment. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. He's pleading with God. God, I want to know you. My source of enjoyment is in God himself. I want to know this. I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength, and I want to know your steadfast love for me. He's pleading for this, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days Why? Because the days down here make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us. You know, this is a fallen world, folks. Your toil, your work will always have thorns and thistles. This is a broken world, and you're not going to straighten it, right? So how do you live? How do you find enjoyment in this? Well, in God, make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us for as many years as we have seen evil. So enjoyment comes 
from God and his gifts. 1 Timothy 6.17 says this, as for the rich in this present age, you've been, God's blessed us with riches. Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. That makes it an idol. But on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. <laughs> I love it. God's serious about enjoyment. He commends it. So here's a picture of my granddaughter. I'm very careful how often I show pictures of my granddaughter. I do not want to become the nauseating grandparent. But this is my granddaughter, and she has a balloon. The day after Christmas, she got this balloon. She came over to our house with her balloon, and she wanted Papa to play with it with her. And she ran around the living room and giggled and laughed as we popped the balloon up in the air. Now, I bought her some really cool stuff for Christmas. <laughs> but I thought, there's enjoyment. Solomon says, you got work. You got bread, you got something to drink, you got somebody to eat with, ah, there's nothing better to find joy in God and in his good gifts. Let's pray. As we close, uh, if you know God, if you have found the Lord to be the love of your life, if, he, if, you, if you've already understood that God loved you so much that he came and, as a man at Christmas and, and died on the cross for you to, to reconcile you to God so that you could open up the pathways to even enjoy God and know God, and you have surrendered your life to him, you have turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior and your reconciler to God, if you know that, that's your experience, then you pray right now, God, show me enjoyment. You commend it. You're serious about it. And help me not to chase the wind. If you're here this morning and you're going, man, I'm one of those pleasure seekers, empire builders, academic achievers. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm at the place that Solomon was of great despair. And apart from and maybe this morning, the Lord's saying, hey, you need me. You need me. And maybe this morning, right where you sit, you're going to say, okay, God, I want to come to you. I want you to forgive me. I am a sinner, and I've run in all kinds of different directions, doing my thing, writing my own rules, doing it my own way, and I'm tired, and I, I can't handle this anymore, and I'm coming to you. And you surrender your life right now and say, God, I'm yours. Forgive me. I want to be your child. I want to find enjoyment in you, period. And he will usher you into a life that will know true satisfaction and enjoyment. Father, may these words from your word deeply penetrate our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen.